Welcome back. So when we line up genomes, we're looking at what has changed and what has been preserved in the chimp and human genomes since they diverged from a common ancestor, perhaps our friend Salinophropus here, 7 million years ago. Take any stretch of human DNA and the stretch of chimp DNA that corresponds to it, they'll represent the same piece of ancestral DNA passed down in two separate lineages over the course of 7 million years. Now, if we take a sequence, and this is a million intended to be gibberish up here, from a chimp and a human, and you put it through a computer, you're going to find hidden messages. This is hidden. This is hidden. Computers are good at finding this kind of thing. Stuff that's better preserved than it should have been just by chance and stuff that is different. We call the ability of computers to extract useful information from genomes bioinformatics. And of course, given big data, computers are crucial. They enable us to ask questions and get answers in ways we never have before. Applying bi bioinformatics to the human and chimp sequence, we find about 98.5% of it is conserved. And this is 1.5% that's interesting because it identifies a set of mutations that accumulated in the DNA of the chimp lineage, and some of these were a major chimp a chimp, and another set of mutations that accumulated in our lin lineage, making us humans. So how do we differ from chimps? Well, about one in a hundred base pairs is different as compared to an average of one in a thousand between you and me. And given that the genome is three billion base pairs long, that means there may be 30 million human specific letters of code that are not shared by the chimp. In addition, there are about five million indels, which I remember means insertions and deletions in the genome. And they're mostly in regions that don't encode proteins. And that means that not many of those five million indels will contain genes. So there's not going to be many copy number variations in us and chimps. Now, bear in mind that there are copy number variations between us. So I may have more or less genes than you. But if we look at those genes where modern humans all seem to have the same number, then about 30 genes are replicated in us since we split from chimps. That's not many. So we have a very similar number of genes as a chimp. But interestingly, a lot of the extra genes we've got are involved in brain development. The, the best study of these is a gene called SRGAP2. Genes have names like that, don't worry about it. Anyway, this gene duplicated three to four million years ago when we first began using tools. And again, 2.5 million years ago when our genus Homo separated from the Australopithecines, who had brain sizes not much larger than that of modern apes. So what that means is that we now have three copies of the gene, whereas chimps only have one. Studies of mice have shown that having these extra copies of SRGAP2 would have changed our ancestors' neurons so they developed complicated shapes that made them capable of exchanging information with a larger number of neighboring cells. So SRGAP2 teaches us that evolution wasn't just about giving us bigger brains, it also changed the way our brain cells interacted. Now, something else interesting about these duplications is that they would have changed brain development immediately and dramatically. So human ancestors with two, three, or even more copies of the gene could have coexisted at one point, which is kind of fun to think about. Well, a jury is still out on the impact of most of the other indels, which is not surprising as we're still trying to work out the impact of the indels and copy number variants in human variability. So scientists comparing humans and chimps, they've mostly focused on those SNPs. It's been estimated that out of the 30 million SNP differences with the chimp, perhaps 10,000 were changes to protein coding genes that altered our bodies and therefore were subject to selection. And on top of that, there's going to be mutations to regulatory regions of our DNA that turn genes on and off. So the, the questions are, which of those particular DNA changes actually made us human? And how do we identify the sequences that make us human? Well, to find out which of these spelling differences in DNA sequences are most important, Catherine Pollard at the University of California in San Francisco has developed powerful computer software for scouring the genomes of human chimps and other vertebrates. She's looking for hotspots along the genome where DNAs change especially rapidly in the lineage that led to humans. Pollard and her team reasoned that DNA sequences that had undergone the most modification since a human chimp split were the sequences that most likely shaped humankind. So where chimp and monkey and mouse and cat and chicken and fish have exactly the same letter at a certain place for hundreds of millions of years, 
It suggests that evolution wouldn't let it change because it was needed for an important role in these animals. So the Pollock lab has thus far identified 202 cases where there's a sudden burst of change in a DNA region in the human lineage, and they call these recently changed regions human accelerated regions of halves, H-A-R-S, halves. Now what's really interesting was that a lot of the sequences that are really different between us and chimps don't encode proteins. So that means proteins don't have it all their own way in evolution. But then we could have guessed that, right? It comes back to the fact that a lot of the 98% junk matters. It contains regulatory sequences that tell other genes when to turn on and off, as well as a whole lot of DNA having purposes that scientists are only just beginning to understand. The majority of halves seem to be involved in gene regulation, because they are sitting in front of genes of at least near them. So for these halves, Pollard and her researchers figure out what gene it's next to, and then they ask, where and when is that gene switched on or off during embryological development? And then, is its expression pattern different in the human than in a mouse, a rat, or a chimp? If it is, then the novel pattern may prove to be relevant to an understanding of how humans are distinctive creatures. Well, HAR1 tops the list of the most divergent sequences between us and chimps, and it's an exciting finding because it seems directly linked with our braininess. So look at this table. It shows the HAR1 sequence in, in us, in chimps, and in uh, chickens. This region of the genome, as you can see, has changed very little for most of vertebrate evolution because the chimp and the chicken sequences here differ by just two letters. Well, the fact that HAR1 R1 has been essentially frozen in time for 300 million years since the chimp and the chicken had a common ancestor indicates that it does something very important. However, the human HAR1 has undergone 18 substitutions. That it underwent abrupt revision in humans suggests that its function was significantly modified in our lineage. Now, the real exciting thing about HAR1 is that it's in, it's in a genetic region that is turned on early in neurons that play a key role in developing the neocortex, the wrinkled outermost brain layer. When things go wrong in these neurons, you get a cerebral cortex that lacks folding, a very sad condition called lysencephaly. Now, it's not known what R1 does in those neurons, but it's just active in the right time and place to be instrumental in the formation of a healthy cortex. Thus, potentially, how one could have altered ancestral human brain function. We, we don't really know much about how the human cortex develops, but the HAR1, the HAR1, provides a new lead and a target for experimentation. So aside from braininess, what other feature is often used to distinguish humans from our fellow apes? We're the apes with the big brains and we've got the opposable thumbs. So would you like to hazard a guess? What do you think? HAR2 does, HAR2 does. Well, it turns out the second most divergent sequence between us and chimps is a regulatory region, an enhancer, that drives gene activity in the wrist and the thumb during fetal development. Well, that's particularly interesting as the ancestral version in other primates doesn't do this. The human HAR2, HAR2, perhaps therefore contributes to human specific hand coordination and the dexterity to manufacture complex tools. Now, please note, that doesn't make chimp hands inferior. Chimps don't want a thumb. Chimps swing through the trees. All you need is a little hook for that. A thumb would get in the way of a chimp and its lifestyle of choice. Now, there are several other preliminary stories relevant to the brain. HAR152, for example, is near the gene encoding a protein called neurogenin 2 that's expressed in the region of the hippocampus. We'll talk about the hippocampus in later lectures. But the hippocampus has a central role in learning and memory. Pollard's group believe, though, that once all the experiments have been done, it's going to turn out that more than half of the halves probably upregulate genes that do things in our brains. Thus, even though halves make up a minute portion of the genome, Changes in these regions could have profoundly awed to the human brain, influencing the activity of whole networks of genes. Have a look at this model. You have a master regulatory sequence that perhaps encodes a regulatory protein, which switches on a battery of other genes. Some of these in turn switch on other genes, so you get a, a cascade of changes 
just resulting from one sequence changing. Perhaps this uh, downstream uh, gene here produces an enzyme that makes a hormone. You take the gene, that particular downstream gene, I'll produce slightly more or less hormone, and I'll be a little different than the other kids on the block. But if I mutate the master regulator downstream here, upstream here, beg your pardon, I could affect hundreds of genes. It'll have a radical impact. It's possible I won't even get to be born. But if I am born, I'll certainly be different, and natural and sexual selection will say if it works. It may be then that the way to evolve a human from a chimp human ancestor without adding much genetic innovation is to change sites where changes make an important difference in an organism's functioning. By changing regulatory sequences that tell genes when and where to turn on and off, you can redeploy the existing squad of genes in new and interesting ways, and the results can be dramatic. Like changing a sports manager could have a much greater impact on a team's performance than just switching out individual players.